Mm. Hello, uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone with the I2B2 Transmart Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to our community meeting for April 2020. As usual, the uh, this call, uh, the Zoom meeting will be recorded and the recording will be made available both on our YouTube channel as well as on the foundation website uh, within a, a day or two, hopefully, uh, along with the, the slide deck. <clears throat> the agenda for today on the next slide. We're going to cover uh, a number of uh, very exciting topics, hopefully, and um, cover some new information uh, that I think will be interesting to the, to the whole group. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Diane Keogh, our uh, Managing Director. Diane? Thank you, Rudy, um, and thanks, everyone. Thanks for, for joining. Um, certainly, the world has changed a lot since our last call just a month ago. Um, I'm sure that you're all either, you know, working remotely or, or if you're at a hospital, you're, um, you're tucked away with your, your face mask on and, and I hope um, everyone is doing well. You're, I'm coming to you uh, in my, my basement, which is my new office, which is uh, driving me a little bit crazy, but, um, but I'm, I'm safe and healthy and I'm so thrilled that I have uh, a job where I feel like I can contribute to the to the pandemic and 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 hopefully um, make a difference. And I think you probably all feel the same. So, so as Rudy said, we have a, an exciting agenda. We actually um, things have have really started to to heat up for us and 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 move along. So, um, Rudy, why don't you go to your the next slide and I'll kick it off. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I, I want to mention is the, um, the is, is sort of an administrative thing, but, but very important to us. Um, we are ex still accepting nominations for um, our board. We have three um, open um, seats at this time. Um, the slide in front of you is a, a list of our the board, the current board members um, that will remain um, on the board. Um, the board is very, very uh, important in helping us set our strategic direction. You know, promoting um, the foundation, um, establishing goals. They also play a really critical role in helping us. Um, uh, with sponsorships and, or identifying sponsorship opportunities, which is um, necessary to, to drive this foundation. Um, they meet on a quarterly basis, and we usually have one in-person meeting a year, although um, I think this year it's probably not going to be in person. Uh, next slide, Rudy. Uh, if you're interested in nominating um, someone, um, here is the information. You can, uh, the nominations, we kept it open actually in uh, another couple of weeks. It's, uh, it will be closing on April 30th. Um, and here is the, um, the link uh, from our website um, where you can place that nomination. Um, uh, and uh, next slide, Rudy. So the Harvard Symposium, um, and you, you can go to the next slide, Rudy. So I think, um, uh, as most of you probably know, the meeting is and will be um, June 11th and 12th. Um, we made the decision, um, it's kind of an obvious decision to uh, turn this into a, a virtual conference um, it, instead of trying to make it in person because it's probably not going to happen. Um, it also opens up the opportunity for a lot more people to participate in the meeting. Um, and we're, we're not going to be having a, a separate meeting in Europe this year, um, so it, it really opens it up for the Europeans to be able to participate as well. Um, it's still going to be two days, and the agenda that we had posted before is going to be modified um, as the world has changed in the past, you know, six or eight weeks. We're going to be uh, adjusting that um, that agenda to really focus uh, primarily on COVID-19 projects, um, and then a few other, you know, roadmaps and things like that for the foundation. So I think it's going to be really exciting. We'll um, we'll make sure that the um, the conference is is um, recorded so people can um, can go back and, and view the um, the different sessions. Um, please continue to register. I we've actually had quite a few registrations come in over the past um, week or so af after our our newsletter went out. I think we have about fifty five registrations so far. Um, but please continue to register, we'll, which will give us an idea of the type of, of the number of people that will. Um, Will be coming. We'll probably increase our Zoom to, to handle at least 500, so I think we'll we'll have plenty of space for everyone. Um, but no lunch this year, so sorry about that. Anyway, we'll we'll be talking more about the agenda, but um, check out our website as we as we start to to form that. 
we can go to the next slide, Rudy. Actually, Rudy, this one's yours. I'll do this one, yep. So uh, finally, I think we're, we're excited to announce that um, Transmart version 19 is ready for release. Uh, all the, the final uh, goods will be uh, appearing um, in the next couple of days um, on, our, on our, the usual sites on uh, GitHub. <clears throat> there is information on the wiki in terms of what's in the release and uh, release notes and things and information that you need. Um, there is a demo site. You can actually try it out uh, and uh, try some things and see how the, the new uh, things are, are working. Uh, and of course, we do capture all of our uh, comments, bugs, defects into JIRA. Um, <clears throat> and we do have an install script, which uh, will install it on Ubuntu 18.4 uh, using Postgres at this point. Um, the Oracle version will be following shortly. Uh, the release contains a number of cleanups, um, a, a lot of work being done. Uh, and a great big thanks to Peter Rice um, from Axiomedics, who continues to serve as our release manager. Um, pulling together lots of changes, improvements in ETL, loading, data loading. Um, uh, just across the board, you'll see a lot of cosmetic and a lot of uh, changes to the organization of things. Um, and, you know, simple, seemingly simple things like the help system is now plugged back in again. And when you ask for help, you get help on the, uh, the topic of interest. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that and um, you know, give it a try. And if you have any questions, um, please let us know. But um, it is uh, it is officially released uh, as of this week, and um, encourage you to use it. And uh, you'll hear more about it uh, in the next couple of slides uh, on, on what we're doing with it. Okay, Diane. So the I, I wish I had a drum roll because I think this is a this is a <laughs> really really exciting um, announcement um, that I want to make and. Um, I have to. I have to say, we are our new um, sponsor, Dell Technology, um, has awarded us a, a very significant grant um, to provide um, some support in very specific areas. And um, actually, you can go to the next slide, Rudy. Um, and the, the the grant is significant, and it's it's something that we that will help us really. Um, work on many, many aspects of our platforms that will allow us to uh, further the adoption. Um, Rudy's actually going to go into the details of the three different projects that have been um, uh, submitted or awarded. Um, but I just, I, I have to, to really thank um, Dell Technology um, for working with us and identifying uh, the Transmart Foundation as a technology partner that will further the, um, the support of of clinical research, and specifically right now, we're focused on COVID-19, but as everyone knows, the, the changes and enhancements to these platforms to support this particular um, disease um, will be carried on, um, and, uh, and, and hopefully we won't have another pandemic in our lifetime, but there'll be other things that, um, that, that this will support. Um, so really, they, we envision this to be a model for, for our systems uh, moving forward. Um, in the future. So um, Rudy will take uh, the next slide to go into detail and then um, our board member uh, David Diamond uh, from Dell Technology will talk a little bit about um, their efforts um, around this. So Rudy? Yes. Thanks, Diane. So there are three projects that are a part of this, uh, this funding. Um, these are, are significant um, support uh, and projects that we have uh, in, in one form or another talked about uh, and just not really had the funding to, to, to do uh, and, and all of which are really focused on for, for today the COVID-19 um, uh, research uh, across the community uh, using um, you know and in particular using the ITB2 and Transmart platforms. Uh, the first two are really focused on things that we will get done very quickly uh, and, and out there, and then the third one's going to take uh, throughout the year to, to complete. And so the first one is um, Foundation is working very closely with Keith Elliston and Peter Rice uh, at Axiomedics, uh, where they will be standing up a uh, public version in the cloud uh, of Transmart version 19 um, that uh, everyone uh, can access. And what they're doing is, is re uh, looking out for what uh, data sets are available um, in particular, genomic data sets uh, on either COVID-19 or some of the related viruses 
um, that might be of interest. Uh, and what the work is to curate these data sets, get them loaded uh, into uh, this public instance of I2B2 and make that available for, for people to use as part of their research program. Uh, the data sets will also be downloadable so that you could use them in your own uh, Transmart instance. Um, and the, the other aspect of this uh, is that we are uh, going to be uh, setting up a consortium where if, if you have data, uh, genomic data in particular, that you want to make, uh, you can make public, um, this can also be a repository for, for uh, others' data. So we'll be soliciting across the community uh, data that is um, publishable and then open, uh, and then that, that could also be loaded into this platform. Uh, and we believe that this could be a, a great help uh, to the community uh, as we gather this information together. And also in, in some ways a showcase on how uh, research is, uh, can be shared, you know, when uh, with the appropriate um, uh, uh, caveats in terms of the, what's available uh, to the public where, you know, the power of the Transmar platform, the analytical tools, the, the genomic analysis uh, can be brought to bear uh, on uh, this particular uh, you know, COVID-19 problem, but also uh, in the future for related uh, types of things. Um, rather than going into a lot more detail today at the next community meeting, um, Keith uh, and I will, will present, uh, and, and Peter will present uh, much more detail uh, of hopefully uh, a working version of the system as they're starting immediately to get this loaded and we expect to have it uh, up and running uh, with the first data sets um, within within a month time frame. So that's the, the first project. Um, second project is uh, one working with Griffin Weber. Uh, Griffin had previously created a, a pro project called Profiles, uh, which um, collects information on um, uh, authors and published papers uh, and uh, can do interesting things like disambiguate author names uh, for articles so that when you find an author of interest, you can uh, search that author and find all of their papers uh, um, reliably. Uh, as, as he scanned uh, the literature since January, uh, there have been over 1,500 articles um, published already on COVID-19 with nearly 4,000 authors. Uh, and uh, the thought was that this would be a wonderful resource uh, for the community to have this kind of who's who of COVID-19 research uh, available. Uh, again, this is you know, software that has been used in a number of other projects and something that Griffin will work on and uh, get um, uh, a version of this up and running within the next month or so. Uh, and again, that will be available, we'll publish it uh, on our website and uh, all the links and appropriate uh, references will be available. Uh, so again, it's another uh, component you know, that would be really helpful, we believe, to the community. And then the third piece um, is really um, bringing together, uh, back together I2B2 and Transmart. Uh, when the, the foundations, uh, I2B2 Foundation and Transmart Foundation uh, came together in 2017, uh, it was with a vision of having the two platforms uh, interoperate uh, and be able to take advantage of the best of, of each uh, in a fashion that data could be shared between them so that you can use I2B2 and the power that it offers for clinical research and, and clinical data analysis and Transmart with uh, much more advanced analytical tools and genomic analysis uh, tools um, be able to use together uh, in uh, a research project uh, and, and be able to literally move data between the two systems. Uh, they both were, I mean, Transmart in many ways was derived from I2B2 and this is something that we've been talking about and, and wishing that we could uh, implement uh, for the last two, three years. Uh, the funding from Dell now gives us the opportunity to, to kind of complete that. And so the, the goal here is to have uh, the data models completely um, uh, aligned uh, and the tools, appropriate tools available. So that, for example, you could go into I2B2, select a cohort of, of patients, based on their lab tests, based on you know, any other uh, clinical information that you might have, move that, that cohort into Transmart, uh, do further analysis using the, the, 
different um, R tools and, and uh, Fractalis or whatever that, to do the analysis, and then also merge that with the genomic data uh, and be able to have then uh, much more, much richer studies and analysis that could be done. Uh, and so the, the, the goal here is to really have this all um, defined, pulled together and implemented uh, over the next several months uh, and um, have these then all these changes and enhancements brought into the, the formal uh, next versions of the platform. Uh, and this really, you know, realizing the goal of um, having this interoperability across the platforms. Um, and then also uh, as part of the, uh, the, the grant, we will be doing some work in terms of uh, improving in installation uh, of uh, I2B2. Uh, there's work on the I2B2 ontology uh, enhancing it to be able to handle COVID-19 uh, lab tests. Uh, this is work that's been going on together. And then we'll be working on some, just some sample implementations to show, you know, this federation uh, across the institutions uh, and also integration with uh, some other data science tools uh, as, as you look at this entire environment. So that's the third project. The, the results of that will be much uh, further down, further out in the year, probably towards the end of the year. Um, but, um, you know, again, this is funding that uh, we really couldn't uh, uh, make such a quick um, uh, work uh, on these projects that, uh, as again, we've been thinking about for a while. Um, the, the impact uh, could really be, you know, quite profound because, you know, the, with the use of I2B2 across the community the, the, uh, and, and of Transmart, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential um, uh, labs using them today uh, is doing research that that is relevant uh, bringing uh, these these uh, you know as we look down the road when these projects are completed you can start to see uh, a really uh, an aggregated set of capabilities uh, that is really uh, quite profound and, and quite uh, helpful you know in the the global clinical and translational research effort uh, and so we believe that this you know these really uh, uh, critical um, groundwork projects that you know we're, we're tackling here really going to provide uh, a very strong uh, platform uh, as we move into the into the next next stage so uh, i think david would you from dell would you like to say a few words sure um, absolutely and again, and again we, we, we thank you we thank you deeply for the uh, for the grant uh, well, we can thank uh, all of Dell. So um, I, I think you did a great job going through and setting that up with the social impact from the foundation's perspective. I just wanted to you know, let you know that we feel it was critical uh, for us to become sponsors. What the foundation is doing in the charter of bringing together I2B2 and Transmart aligns 100% with what we're, our North Star is in our healthcare business, but also in our social innovation uh, initiatives and, and the charter. And, um, you know, that really is focused on precision population health engagement and to do that by building platforms. So we see tremendous uh, synergies in doing that. I also want to just mention it's, it's a real honor uh, to me um, and I, into our company for me to be appointed to the board We've been in the healthcare business for quite a long time. I've been in it for almost 30 years now, just in hospital IT. So um, you can expect an ongoing commitment uh, from our team. We've got many of them on the call today uh, and over from, overall from Dell Technologies and related to social innovation. Um, so I just give you a, a little bit of background here. We wanna do this type of funding uh, across the globe. And we're doing it right now, it's just really declared this morning that our focus is COVID-19 across the whole company with social innovation and giving. And we think that it's important to be responsive to, uh, to COVID, but it's probably more enduring for us to focus on the future and having the tools available, um, you know, particularly across our 6,000 healthcare uh, customers. Those are hospitals worldwide. Um, to be uh, more proactive and, and pre preventive uh, in recurrence. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity that we see to be able to enable um, advancing and really accelerating medical science. And uh, if you think about it, we, we kind of break it down to three things. 
the first one is um, to solve the social issues. And that includes economic impact and economic enablement opportunities. This comes from our 2030 moonshot goal set by Michael Dell to impact a billion um, you know, human, human lives and to do that through the development of collaborative ecosystems. And then to establish uh, really an enterprise operating model where we can come together with our business and some of our tools uh, across this whole foundation and we see things like the ACT initiative and kind of the magnetic attraction of data. Uh, that's an example of some of the things we've done in the past and would like to have many, many more without necessarily having to nurture them, but by continuing to enable them through the foundation. So we do have you know, some examples of how we've done things. I'd mentioned uh, on the first call, we introduced Dell Technologies about the digital life care societal platform. It's, it's really an ideal way for us to engage in po populations around the world. And we did this in India uh, in, um, in conjunction with Tata Trust and using India Stack. Uh, the other one uh, is you know, a call out really to TGen. They've also joined as sponsors to the foundation, but this is raw innovation. There was something, an opportunity in the market. We had the technology and the science and uh, kind of a collaborative ecosystem of technology partners like Intel. We went off to build something and it took eight years to build. And after about two years, we had results. And that's an example, uh, something we'd like to do more of that's very targeted, in particular at uh, non-communicable diseases where there isn't a lot of philanthropy actually. Um, and then the work that we've done within that realm on uh, cancer trials is particularly uh, applicable to the ACT network and all, all the things that will follow after COVID with the 70 companies that are working on vaccines and therapies. Um, and I just, I want to just call out, you know, beyond just TGen that we are starting to work with the CDC Foundation. We're members of the foundation. We're engaged at the WHO level. Um, we're looking at you know, real policies and science-based uh, opportunities to return to work for our employees. And that represents not just our 160,000 employees, but all of our partner and peers in the industry that up to several, several millions of employees, 80% of which are working at home. So you can see there's a tremendous impact. We're interleaved with Pivotal Act, which is our, you know, cloud native software development tool group, which is activist oriented and can do projects there. We have uh, Steve Laser on today. He's a CTO office ambassador that keeps us interlocked with what we're doing as a company overall. An example of that is deep, deep into autonomous vehicles, requirements, edge computing, 5G. These are all things that are gonna be very important to collaborative healthcare. And our government affairs group is engaged nationally, but internationally, and really important to us at the state level. We have excellent um, relationships at the state level. Um, we work and we do social innovation, not just through, um, you know, through things like foundations and, and uh, you know, really mission-oriented organizations. We do it with customers. I've mentioned this before on our call that we have the raw technology, we have the business orientation, uh, and we know how to have impacts. We have marketing, social media channel applications and amplifications. But I did just want to, you know, a quick shout out again to TGen. We've been on board with them for quite a while. They push us to the limits. And also Partners Healthcare, we've been in collaboration with them for almost seven years now. And between those two things, that's given us access to this foundation and community and underscored um, how important it is that we move into open source and constant contribution. So just wanted to recognize the opportunity that we've had to get involved, our continuous focus on staying involved and doing projects like this that help us uh, really meet our goal of having that enduring impact. So we look forward to the publishing that's coming out of this. The, the work that Griffin will do with the, you know, we call it the Ready Research Platform and some of the innovation that we can contribute there with our own employees is going to be exciting. Uh, and then the convergence of the platforms when I read some of the, the papers that are coming out related to that over the last year. Um, you know, we're so so excited to how we can align and have an impact with that. We are also sponsors of the, uh, of the uh, you know, the meetings you're gonna have in June and then the European meeting. Um, and we've had to do that ourselves and shift gears to Dell Technologies World Virtual. So we think we have some experience there we can really help out with too. So that, that kind of sums it up. And uh, so Rudy, I'll pass it back to you. Great, 
Thank you very much, David. Now we're going to talk about something that um, has come up in the last four weeks um, from uh, Zach Tahani and his group. Uh, and uh, I think Diane is going to go through this. Yeah, I'm going to, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, it, the 4C Consortium, I'm going to just really tee up and give some of the highlights. And then I'm actually going to ask Griffin Weber to, to fill in the blanks because he has done a, a tremendous amount of work here. So a few weeks ago, uh, an email came out um, from us um, pulling together a, 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 a special community meeting with, um, to, with Zach Ohani and, and, um, and his uh, folks to talk about this initiative. And we had, you know, we had over 100 people join the call. Um, people were really, really interested in, in the work that he was doing. Um, he calls it 4C, uh, Consortium for Clinical Characterization of COVID-19 by EHR. Now remember, Zach was the one that named I2B2 as well. So he, he's, he's really into the acronyms. <laughs> Um, so this is um, an international group of hospitals using I2B2 and OMOP um, that, that uh, led an effort to extract EHR data um, from hospitals with uh, COVID-9. So these are hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Um, there were 96 hospitals from 23 unique um, uh, sites. Um, and it uh, included almost 30,000 uh, COVID-19 positive uh, patients in their data set. Um, the countries were five separate countries, the US, Italy, France, Germany, and Singapore. So next slide. So within a four week period of time, okay, four weeks, this group, this group pulled together um, this data and actually published um, their first um, paper. Um, the pre-release is, is uh, the link is here um, um, on the, the slide, and also um, what they're what they're trying to do is they will gear up uh, for an, the next wave of um, of analysis, and they will be um, asking for data contributions. So if you're interested in co contributing um, data from your organization, and I think Griffin can talk a little bit more about the data that they've they've gotten and the data they probably will want in the next wave, you can um, sign up here on, on the website, um, and then also a link to their, um, their website. The I2B2 Transmart Foundation is really the communications um, platform for this initiative uh, because it's primarily people that, that use our platforms. Um, so I'm excited about that because it, it does bring a lot, of, uh, a lot of traffic and a lot of attention to the foundation, um, and also really shows the, the power of, of, I, of I2B2. Um, in these types of um, situations. So I think the next slide is um, just a copy of the, um, the publication. So can I, Griffin, can I ask you to jump in and, and fill in the blanks here and talk a little bit more about the project and phase two? Yes, uh, Dan. So um, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. So uh, as you probably all know and are probably involved in, there are a lot of ongoing efforts right now to build infrastructure to either um, run federated queries across institutions uh, uh, in their COVID cohort or to be pulling data together into central repositories. Each of these things are, are the ultimate right way of doing the research where you could actually come up with this data harmonization, have all the data accessible for machine learning and other types of analyses. It's going to be a while before these different efforts get to where they really want to go. Um, when we had our initial phone call with Zach four weeks ago, many of us had I see two instances, some had OMOP, and we had data right there where we could think where the idea would be, can we just pull data out whatever way we can right now and, and come up with some interesting findings. So we went back like 20 years in terms of informatics capabilities and uh, saying based on whatever data warehouse you have, is it ITB2 or something else, can you simply run some SQL queries on your database and take the aggregate results that come back from those queries, put them in plain text CSV files, and send it to a secure uh, shared folder where we can do some analysis on it. So we, did, we, knew, in, we knew installing software at institutions would be complicated, getting a, uh, approval from IRBs to be able to share patient level data would take a very long time. So we, our model was, can you run just an aggregate count query, put those aggregate counts into files and send them to us. So institutions were quickly able to go to their IRBs. Most of them 
uh, immediately came back and said this is not human subject research because it's aggregate count. Um, most institutions provided some kind of masking for small counts. Uh, if it was a count, for example, less than 10 or less than five, it wouldn't be included. We have sites to run basically four queries or four tables. One is the number of patients testing for uh, COVID-19 positive by date from their first patient until the current date. The second file was the demographic breakdown of these patients, so um, various age groups, male and female. The third file was looking at about a dozen key laboratory tests. Gabe Brad, who was uh, his first author in this paper with me, um, through literature search identified some key laboratory tests that um, are of interest within uh, a lot of hospitals taking care of these patients. We asked what were the laboratory tests of those patients over time, and then the final uh, file was asking for their ICD-9 or ICD-10 diagnosis codes since they were tested positive. Again, these were all on aggregate counts, so it was all number of patients or mean and uh, standard deviation laboratory test results. We had a, uh, a Rudy set up a um, Dropbox website where you can click to upload the four files from your computer. They were uh, placed in a secured folder. A limited number of analysts had access to that. And um, uh, we were able to create from that a website, covidclinical.net. Um, Nils Goldenberg and his team did all the fancy visualizations on that website where you can see all the different trends in laboratory tests, demographic breakdowns, and, uh, and so on. The key result that we were able to find um, was, first of all, proof of concept. Can you actually, in four weeks, get hospitals to pull out data and pull it together and have some useful information from that? Uh, as sort of a validation of that, the clinical trajectory is the number of pa new patients per day across five different countries and 96 hospitals uh, aligned well with what we've seen elsewhere in the news or in the literature. Also, the laboratory tests that we found also found similar kind of patterns to what have been reported elsewhere. What was really interesting, though, is because we had so many hospitals from so many different countries, we were able to look at differences within a country and differences between countries. And we found was that the differences in laboratory tests between hospitals within a country was larger than the differences between different countries. And this is really important because you probably have heard that certain countries' death rates and disease rates are very different than others. And it's something about the patient populations or the way they're taking care of patients in the countries. And what we find is that within countries, there's huge variability from one hospital to another. And that may be due to the uh, way different hospitals are caring for their patients. Um, there were a lot of limitations with our first four-week study. Um, we didn't have a really good way of validating the file format that people sent us. So although we tried to be clear in what we wanted people, what queries we wanted people to run and how we wanted their files to be set up, um, you know, because it was such a mad rush to get this done, uh, a lot of hospitals sent data in different kind of formats, laboratory tests from different units. So we had uh, many analysts working all day long on late night phone calls trying to clean everything up. In our next round of this, which will probably be starting in the next week or two, um, we'll have a website where you can upload data and it'll perform some of that validation so you immediately know if your file is in the right format or not. We're going to add some variables. We didn't have any outcome variables in the initial set. Um, we were finalizing what it'll be if it's a ventilation or inpatient hospital, say, versus outpatient. Um, and some medication information we can correlate with the other data types. Um, as Diane mentioned, there's a website to sign up. Um, the, there's information online about our phase one data files. But as I mentioned, in the next week or two, we'll be um, adding some things to those. So you may want to hold off a week before, uh, before running the queries because those will probably change in the next um, few days. Um, long term for this, uh, as this project uh, kind of converges with other projects. We're leveraging information that others are doing. So for example, a lot of you are participating in the ACT network, accrual clinical trials. Um, they're set up a test network where they're pulling, doing some federated queries of COVID patients. Um, they've developed a really nice ontology of um, useful concepts related to COVID-19 research and coding for that. Um, and we're leveraging some of those mappings in uh, this 4C project. Um, also, in addition to the kind of plain aggregate text files, 
ultimately we'll be asking sites to run more complex types of analyses locally, um, either with R scripts or Python. Um, but you know, we, we expect that not every site will be able to participate in that level and help you phase that over time. I think that's, uh, that's kind of a brief summary, Diane. That's great. Thank you, Griffin. Um, so, you know, again, if, if your organization is interested in being part of this, um, if you are uh, able to contribute on um, the data, it, and it, again, as Griffin said, the, it's going to change a bit. So, you know, check out what um, was in phase one, but it will change a bit. But if you're interested in uh, participating in um, submitting data, that's wonderful. I think if, if you submit data, um, you'll be included in the um, in the analytics of that data as well, which I think everybody we've got a lot of requests for for of, for people who just really want to start to um, to to use the data. Um, so that's really really exciting. So um, I will open it up for questions. Um, but we did have a question, Keith Ellison. Actually, this Griffin, this one's for you, yours as well. He's talking about the profiles project, and he's asking um, what's the methodology used to disambiguate the authors. Yeah, so um, Profiles is a website institution downloaded and installed locally, and they load in a list of their local investigators. And the software goes out to things like PubMed and finds publications and uh, NIH Explorer to find grants, creates these online profiles for people. It uses a probabilistic um, uh, disambiguation algorithm. So it takes information that we provide for people, such as their names, email addresses, affiliations and matches that up with um, things within initially PubMed. So uh, it first finds exact matches so it can find your email address or your ORCID ID or something like that. And then it'll find similar publications that um, uh, have your name on it. For example, there are other authors named G. Weber out there, but my G. Weber publications are often in informatics journals. So another G. Weber in another informatics journal is more li likely to be me in a G. Weber in a cardiology journal or some, in a physics journal. Um, certainly happy to chat with you more about this. this. is kind of a whole separate open source tool than ITB2 Transmart. So um, I'll try to end at that point and I can talk offline about that if you're more interested in learning about that technology. So we can open this up for questions um, from the group. Um, also, Griffin mentioned um, the ACT network and the, the fact that they're setting up a, a test network to be able to query for COVID um, patients. I know I saw that uh, uh, Doug McFadden is on this call, so if any questions around that, um, Doug is in the, the thick of things there, um, which is which is very um, very exciting um, as well. Great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining today. I think um, it's, it's a it's a tough time. Um, it's also a time where I think we can really use our our resources and our skills to make a difference, and um, and that that is uh, that's something that we're all we're all focused on doing. So um, I hope everyone has a has a good day, and um, I'm going to give you 16 minutes back. <laughs> so thanks everyone. Thanks.